I'm currently, this is really about my puzzlement, uh, I'm a bit curious as to how doctors go about this business of prescribing and I talked to quite a lot in the last few weeks up and down the country about how they actually choose the medicines they use and why. Um, now I find that deeply fascinating um, so you're, it's going to be inflicted on you. The first thing to say is what's the point of ADHD medicines? I'm going to use the word medicines or drugs or medication. It all means the same thing as far as I'm concerned. Um, the point about it is that it's to strengthen nerve transmission. That is the transmission of impulses from one nerve to another in the brain, especially in the frontal lobes. That's not the total story of ADHD, but that's by and large the thrust, the main point of why medicines for ADHD exist. Now, the frontal lobe uh, is this blue bit at the front. It's a, the stuff above your eyes. It's the most civilised bit of the brain and it does all sorts of very clever things to do with restraining impulses, making social judgments, um, holding working memory, etc, etc. So it's blue stuff. And I'm going to use the word cortex in a minute. The cortex, this is a slice of brain uh, donated by, with permission, I'm sure. Um, which, this is the outside and you see this purple stuff. This is a layer of densely packed nerve cells. There are an awful lot of nerve cells in the brain, more than the NAR stars in the, in the Milky Way, an awful lot. And they, by and large, live on the outside as well in the, a clump in the middle, which I haven't shown there. This stuff is fibres connecting them. It's the white matter. So if I say cortex, I mean this dense layer of nerve cells on the outside. Now that becomes important because if you look at what happens to the development of the outer layer where all the nerve cells are, of the cortex, the frontal lobe, by age, what happens is that it grows. It gets bigger and bigger, but if you've got ADHD, it's lagging about two years behind. So the core issue in terms of anatomy for ADHD is that the development of the cerebral cortex in the frontal lobe Okay? You are concentrating. <laughs> um, is actually slow. Uh, that's a, a fundamental issue uh, in ADHD. It's not the only thing, but it's a very important one. And that's another way of saying it. These, this is a, a brain looked at from the top or from the side. These dark blue areas are where it is two years behind. And this is well established stuff now. This is not radical. If you look not just at the anatomy, but at the function of the frontal lobe, this is, is what happens. A normal person, when they've got to do something, like think hard, um, think slow if you're into that sort of language, they use the front of the brain, front back. But if you've got ADHD, it just doesn't work. So you've got two problems affecting the frontal lobe. It's slow to grow in terms of its outside layer, and it doesn't work as well as it should. That's uh, using a rather um, complicated brain scan. But you can see the same on functional MRI, which you're probably more familiar with, of course. That if you're, this is, these are people who are stopping doing something. The task here is to give uh, ten-year-old boys a button to press which will drop a bomb out of an aeroplane and then a, a light comes on that tells them not to do it. Now that's very difficult if you're a ten-year-old. You want to drop bombs out of pictures <laughs> of aeroplanes. And an ordinary person, the su front and side of their brain, just about here, the dorsolateral, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, if you want me to be precise, lights up. But if you've got ADHD, it just doesn't light up and they drop the bomb. So this is about the, f the brain not functioning as well as it should in its front bits. Now, the way in which the brain is driven is by nerve pathways that come from the middle or the base of the brain and go out towards the front. Now these pathways um, use uh, stuff called uh, neurotransmitter to link one cell to another. I don't think this year I want to go into that uh, unless you push me hard. I've got slides in reserve if you need it, but I think um, it just gets too tiresome. So you've got nerves driving the front of the brain that are linked one to another by a neurotransmitter, and that might be noradrenaline, 
this is I'm, I'm sorry about these brains switching from one side to another but I can't flip these images without flipping the letters as well and if somebody knows how to do it Alistair probably knows how to do it I can't but it's the same principle you've got a nerves coming out of the middle going to the front Oh, yeah. I should just warn you that it's, it, it's active if you touch it. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, did I touch it twice? Yeah. Okay. That was noradrenaline. This actually is a simpler diagram um, you, about the transmitter called dopamine. Dopamine, noradrenaline, two neurotransmitters, both um, busy in the nerve pathways that get the frontal lobe, which is the bit I was talking about earlier, going. Now, so what? Um, this is another brain scan taken from the underside. You put the, scan, you put the camera, as it were, underneath the jaw and you look up at the brain. There's the front, there's the back. I bet you've never seen the underneath of your brain. But this is what it looks like normally in terms of activity. This is a normal functioning brain, front, back. And these areas of purple mean lots of metabolism is going on. This is somebody with ADHD. This is the front of the brain. And in contrast to the last picture, this has got little holes at the front. Now, this doesn't mean that people with ADHD have got holes in their brains. Um, if you do put holes in the brains there, you'll give somebody ADHD. But this means that there isn't any metabolism going on there. There's no glucose uptake. So where you see these little sort of pits, that means something isn't happening. The brain is not soaking up glucose to go about its business. So there's another way of saying the frontal lobe isn't working. And if you tell somebody with ADHD to concentrate, I reckon it gets worse. Okay, so the usual instruction in the classroom, would you please concentrate, actually is quite likely to make things worse in terms of an active brain scan. Now, if you have, go back to this picture, the original picture with the two holes in the front, and you give them stimulant medication, this person at any rate, bingo, the holes disappear. The metabolism, which was not happening at the front of the brain, suddenly starts to happen. So the point about ADHD medicines is to get the front of the brain working and that's a picture of, of it happening. Is that okay so far? Um, and that restores this brain um, to pretty well normal compared with the normal brain of somebody who doesn't have ADHD. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, ADHD med medication makes the nerve pathways in the frontal lobe of the brain, and the frontal lobe cortex in particular, more effective. It gets them going. That's not why it's called stimulant for a large number of the medicines. There's another reason for that, but that's what it does. And it does so by helping the nerve cells pass messages between themselves using neurotransmitters. That's the, where it pretty well, well, it, that's where it usually works and it increases the amount of neurotransmitter available. That's what the medicine does. Is that okay so far? This is the heavy bit, I'm sorry about this. But if you're with me, um, I want to move on to something else. What I think drives an awful lot of non-medics bonkers is the naming of the medicines. It is confusing. Is that a fair comment or are you... Uh, if you're going to say I'm on top of all this, and I'll skip the next <laughs> dozen slides. But, okay. I think the vocabulary of prescribing hinges on the names of drugs, and this is hard to get, I think. Um, don't panic. I'm not going to do that. Um, a drug has a chemical name which we don't use. Uh, nobody is going to go around saying, I'm going to write you up for some 2 piperidine acetic alpha phenyl methyl ester. They're not going to do that. Or if they do, they should be sectioned. Um, <laughs> so I instead of doing that, the, the way in which the scientific community gets around all that is to give a name, a scientific name, to a medicine. Um, and the one that you're probably most familiar with is uh, methylphenidate. So that is the scientific name for that concoction there. Now, all right, so far we have mesalphenidate, and you may see that written on a prescription, because that is the generic name. Um, in fact, what people often talk about is the brand. Now, 
Ritalin happens to be a brand of methylphenidate, one of many. What interests me about this picture, which I think comes from the very early 1950s, and I expect you can't see it, it says Ritalin, antidepressive. Uh, now, Ritalin originally was discovered by a man whose wife played tennis, but not for very long because she had low blood pressure. So she was easily thrashed in the amateur tennis championships. And um, he developed this stuff. Well, actually, he was interested in antidepressant, anti-fatigue. She took it and her tennis improved because it kept her blood pressure up just enough. So he, her name was Rita. Um, and he named it after. It was actually called Ritalina in the beginning, but when his um, invention was bought up uh, they, uh, by C. Bagaghi, they called it Ritalin. So you've got methylphenidate as a generic name, and then you've got all these brands. In, at the moment, in this country, you've got all this lot. You've got those that you take and it lasts about three hours, and they're usually round white pills. You've got those, Equisim XL, Medicinet XL, that last a bit longer. And you've got all this lot that are appearing, um, of which Concerta XL is, is uh, the sort of grandparent, but you've now got all sorts of other stuff. If you see XL, uh, it doesn't mean extra large. Very important if you've got a teenage daughter who looks at this and says, what, why have I got an extra large? Um, it, it, I don't actually know what it stands for, but it means sustained release or extended release or prolonged release. Extra long, extra hmm? long, extended. I said that. And they, and they, uh, actually, nobody knows. It was just a convenient um, way of saying, well, as you say, extra long. Um, but, I mean, uh, the Americans tend to use the term SR, for example, sustained release. So, you know, it's, uh, there isn't a, a generally agreed vocabulary internationally, but yeah, but watch out for XL and teenagers. Now, the importance here, I think, is that the brand names differ. You, you've seen a whole load of brand names for extended release, methylphenidate, sort of notionally 8 to 12 hour release stuff here. And internationally, it, it, if you just take Lisdex amphetamine, which we know as Elvance, um, it's Vivance in the States, and, and I get into discussions about this because people go online, they read on the forums about Vivance, either how terrible it is or how wonderful it is, forums being forums. Um, and they say, well, why can't we have some Vivance? I say, well, you've got it, it's just called Elvance. They say, no, 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 we want Vivance. <laughs> it's the same gunk. It's absolutely the same. I don't know why it was branded differently, um, and I don't know why it suddenly becomes different in, in Ireland. Um, and uh, I, I suspect that Vivance means something shockingly rude in Rio, so they called it Venvance. Uh, and in Chile, well, that's a different ball game. Um, <laughs> So you get different brands in different countries. Now, given that, you, therefore, for any medicine, you've got a chemical name which we'll now forget about, the 2 4 fiperidine, blah, blah, blah. You've got the scientific generic name and the brand name. Now, a prescriber may write the scientific generic name, and I'll explain why if I could, or they may write the brand name. Now. This is not just true for methylphenidate. Sorry, I did part of my training in the States, and for some reason, their pronunciation of methylphenidate has stuck in my mind. You call it methylphenidate, I call it methylphenidate some of the time. But it's the same stuff. You have all these medicines for methylphenidate. For dexamphetamine or lisdexamphetamine, you actually haven't got this big spread. You've got Amphexa as a, a brand name for dexamphetamine. Useful little tablet Amphexa. You can break it into quarters. and You try and do that with an ordinary white tablet, it just leads to mayhem. There was, um, I was at a conference, I was actually talking about this sort of stuff at a, a medical conference a couple of weeks ago, and I said the big problem about dexamphetamine tablets is that people often want to cut them into quarters, and it's bad enough trying to cut an ordinary methylphenidate tablet into half. And somebody said, oh no, that's very interesting, because we were trying to cut one into quarters, and we got the half cut, we got the half on the table, and the other half went onto the kitchen floor. Uh, Jack Russell ate it. 
and you've seen that book called Dogs Have ADHD. <laughs> they said it was the quietest morning we've ever had in the house. <laughs> but Amphexa is a, is a crafty little tablet that easily breaks into quarters just by pressing it, uh, incidentally. And it's cheaper than Dexamphetamine, which is an interesting point. You'll see why in a minute. Uh, Lizdex, of course, is L Vance, Atomoxin, Stratera, Guanfacine, and Tunip. I'm sure you're familiar with that. But you're, you're constantly playing around with some people using this language and some people using brand language. Now, within the NHS, um, doctors are encouraged, encouraged in um, inverted commas, I think, told, basically, is what that means, to use generic terms to use the generic name and if you use if you write out a prescription for methylphenidate 10 milligrams twice daily or something like that that goes off to a hospital pharmacy or a high street chemist and that pharmacy or chemist can then give you anything any brand that includes methylphenidate 10 milligrams they don't have to stick to Ritalin for example which is a 10 milligram preparation they can give you anything um, irrespective of the brand. Once they've got the generic name, the brands don't count. Now, this is why if you take a month's worth of 10 milligram tablets, of course, I mean, you, this wouldn't be um, a month's worth of treatment because you'd be taking more than once a day for 30 days. But ordinary bog standard methylphenidate, if I write a script for methylphenidate, um, it will cost sort of four or five pounds. If I write a script for Ritalin, it's going to be a little bit more. And this is the, one, the main reason why there is a drive to use generic terms. It's, it's money saving. Does it matter? Well, um, it might. Uh, if you go to the XL group, and I don't ask me why Delmasart doesn't have an XL, but it doesn't, and they got away with it. And I'm, you know, these rules are interesting. Um, it's quite a bit, quite a difference from months worth of uh, middle of the range treatment for uh, Concerta XL. It's pretty well twice the price of stuff like Zagatin, Delmasart, or Matteride. And um, if, uh, for that matter, twice the price of Xenidate, you'll notice there's a bit of a gap between Xenidate and the rest, and I'll explain why. So price drives people um, into giving doctors advice to prescribe generically. Does that... are you with me? Yeah. Okay. So that's a, another way of putting it. Um, if you're prescribing immediate release methylphenidate um, a month's worth in NHS terms if you go and buy it at the chemist you'll, you'll be charged double that because chemists um, have the freedom to charge what they like there isn't a price on the private market uh, or on the street actually but um, you know it's sort of 12 quid's worth for immediate release methylphenidate whereas it's nearly twice that if you move on to one of the XLs um, Xenidate being the cheapest or um, brand, uh, the original brand, uh, Concerta XL, it's going to be, you know, nearly four times as much. So although NICE says, and has said repeatedly now in 2008 and in 2018, go for extended release, there are still managers up and down the country grumbling, saying this is costing us money. So we have all that, that price drives people into prescribing generically, uh, and that is the argument for it. But you, you, the, for medium duration XLs, like Medicinet XL or Equisim XL, they're not the same. So if you have a doctor who writes methylphenidate MR, which is what happens, um, 20 milligrams, so clearly not a concerted dose, or 30 milligrams, clearly not a concerted dose, um, the chemist could give you one and could give them the other. Actually, um, that is what the computer is doing. In any GP surgery, there is lurking within her computer a software program that says, ah, ah, you prescribed a brand, we're now going to convert it to a generic. 
The software does that automatically. The, uh, not all software, but the most popular one used, will convert brand names, if a GP uses a brand name, to a generic. Um, and uh, that's held to be a good thing in one quarters, but uh, actually they're not the same. If um, I'm sorry to show graphs to you at half past 11 in, in the morning, it's not fair, but basically if you take a plain tablet, an ordinary methylphenidate tablet, an ordinary Ritalin tablet, God knows what, what happens to your, the concentration in your blood is that after about two hours it's peaked. This is the amount in your blood, the concentration in your blood, this is the time. So you take one there and you take another one four hours later and you get another peak. That is what is going on if you take 10 milligrams of ordinary methylphenidate twice daily. Whoops, I shouldn't have touched it. Now, if you are in the business of trying to design a capsule Tablets are round and hard, capsules are sausage shaped and squidgy, yeah? If you're trying to, to design something that you take once a day that mimics that, you go for Equisim XL because that curve is nearly the same. It isn't quite the same, but I was actually involved in this many, many years ago. Crikey. Um, 30 years ago? I was actually one of the team that advised on how to do it. And I thought for quite a long time we got it wrong. I begin to think nowadays we got it right. But our attempt was to model it and imitate that. Is that okay? Now that's different from Medicinet. Medicinet XL, I should have said Medicinet XL, what happens is you get a big boost right at the beginning of the day and then a little bit of hump. And then although it lasts about the same amount of time, you don't get as much in the blood in the afternoon. And the reason for that is because it was designed in, Germ in Germany. And in Germany, primary school aged children go to school and they come home for lunch. And that's it. So if you're trying to treat ADHD in Germany, you just want to hit them hard, as it were. I'm sorry to use combative language. Um, but you're trying to pile in stuff to make sure that the mornings work, because the afternoons in school terms don't exist. Um, whereas in this country, for primary school aged children, you're actually, you actually got them in the morning and in the afternoon. So you're trying to do something slightly different. Uh, or in America for that matter. Um, I don't want to talk about Concerta XL, but I want to flag up the difference between these two, because it is different. And um, a well set up, don't even look at that, but a well set up prescriber will have uh, a chart now known as the Bezier chart, after Steve Bezier. Um, actually, he wanted to call it the Bezier Hill chart because I had an input into this, but I said no, I don't want to be associated with all those numbers, it's too much. Um, so it's now the, it's the Bezier chart. Uh, and this shows for any one medicine, let's say Equisim XL, what happens for a 40 milligram dose, what happens in the first four hours, the four hours after that, and then after that. Now this is not important for you, believe me, but it is important if you're trying to switch somebody from, let us say, Medicinet XL 40, you want to try and match that with Equisim, you're going to go for a different dose. Um, you're going to go something more like a 40 million, well actually, it depends which way you want to match it. Um, but it's, this is all about matching when you're moving from one medicine to another. Is that okay? But they're not the same. Um, so that's one problem, that if you prescribe generically, um, you may prescribe somebody Equisim XL so that they're completely stoned in the afternoon if they've been doing very nicely on Equisim and you might just say, well, you know, sorry, whoops, doing very nicely on Medicinet XL, let us say at 40. You switch them to Equisim XL at 40, they're going to get a, a much bigger boost in the afternoon and sometimes that is too much. Well, quite often it's, it's okay. Go on. That's a quick question. My son's on Concerta. I yep. don't work on anything. Could you say a little something? The Concerta tablet is a very complex tablet, I expect you know. The, the, on, on the outside of the Concerta tablet there's a layer of methylphenidate. So immediately you swallow it, that layer dissolves off. It acts just as though you're taking an ordinary methylphenidate or Ritalin 
immediate release tablet. So the first wave of release is just the outside. Now one of the problems with um, Concerta is that that's only 22% of the dose. So a lot of people when they take Concerta they don't get much of a hit in the morning. I'm still talking combative language, aren't I? But, um, there's, then what happens is once that layer is dissolved off, you're left with a sort of shell. And that shell sucks in water at the base of it and it squeezes out stuff through a tiny hole which you can't see at the top. And this first wave of squeeze out stuff, let us say from four hours to eight hours roughly, uh, does actually give you a decent level of, um, it's not a huge level, but it's a decent level of methylphenidate. Then there's a more concentrated layer that is underneath that that is then squeezed out. So you do actually not, you don't get a peak because the squeezing is gradual, but you get this long tail off. So Concerta lasts longer for most people. It's supposed to last 8 to 12 hours. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but the Concerta is a different system, and it's a system called Oros. And I think I'll come back to that if I may. But it, it is a different way of doing things, but it's the same gunk inside. It's methylphenidate inside. I can see from those charts that I, I can see that's what my son takes. Yeah. Think, yeah. Yes. I mean, he, if you talk to him about it, mm. if you can get a coherent answer out of him, he may say it's not much good in the morning. Uh, um, but I don't eat lunch because that, that's when that wave is coming in. The next problem with generic prescription is what's known as bioequivalence. Um, you have a prescription and it's written methylphenidate 10 milligrams three times daily or something like that. You take it into the chemist and they last, last month they gave you Ritalin this month you, they give you Tranquilin and you, you say this isn't quite as good and the chemist says it's exactly the same that is wrong uh, what they actually mean is it is bioequivalent now bioequivalent doesn't mean exactly the same bioequivalent is a term used by people like the MHRA you know the licensing authorities or the European Medicines Association, or, or the, uh, um, the FDA in the States. Bioequivalent means that when you bring out a new generic form, a new, you decide you're going to make um, some methylphenidate tablets that are going to be much cheaper than Ritalin, and therefore going to make you a lot of money. And you make a 10 milligram tablet, and you go off to the MHRA, and you say, I've got this new tablet. Um, and they say, fine, can we see what it releases in the blood? And you say, yes, I have these studies here. They were done in Manchester. They're always done in Manchester. <laughs> Until they discovered the Indian market. Um, but what? I, I remember doing this with a, a, a tablet which doesn't exist any longer, called, simply called Equisim. Um, I, I went to the MHRA and they were looking at Equisim, and I said, but these blood levels aren't anything like as good as Ritalin. They said, shut, shut, new boy, shut up, you don't understand. I said, yeah, I don't understand. Why aren't they the same? They said, it only has to be 80%. For bioequivalence, you have to match the original brand, the lead brand, by between 80 and 125%. Now, nobody's going to go for 125%. They're going to go for 80%. And uh, this is the problem, that it can be bioequivalent, but actually not numerically equivalent. It may only release 80% as much as the brand lead. And this was the story with Equisim, which was the first Ritalin imitator. Uh, the, the, the parents were saying, yeah, we've got it. It's not quite the same, is it? You know, they knew. And there was then this big argument about equivalence, because they would go to the GP and the GP would say, it's the same stuff. But actually it isn't quite. And um, I think we're seeing this now, I think we're seeing this now with Tranquilin. I get so many reports that Tranquilin isn't quite up to it. I'm sure Tranquilin is bioequivalent. It wouldn't be on the market if it wasn't. That doesn't mean it's, reduce, it's producing exactly the same amount of medicine in the blood that, uh, let us say, Ritalin, which is the, the one they have to match because it was the original brand. So this is a problem. If you write a generic prescription, you may actually, at the end of the day, be writing up 
for something that is only 80% of the power. Are, are you with me? Not many people know that. They really don't. I've had so many arguments with pharmacies, uh, uh, pharmacists, because uh, uh, I send the parents back saying, look, stick to the brand you've always stuck with. If it's Tranquilin and you've been fine on Tranquilin, stick to that, because you may find, recently, let us say, a bit strong. But uh, the, other, the, the other way around happens. I mean, I noticed that when there was great nervousness about giving Rory Bremner um, some methylphenidate uh, on camera on the Horizon program, Phil Asherson, very cunningly I thought, gave him some Tranquilin, thinking this is not going to have quite the same hit as Rizalin. <laughs> um, I much teasing follows. So bioequivalence is not exact equivalence in spite of what the doctor says, in spite of what... I mean, I've worked on these agents. I've worked for all three of those agencies. Uh, so um, I reckon I know. But if you doubt me, go to the EMA website, which is European Medicines Agency, uh, and within that very big website, if you look for bioequivalence, it will tell you just that. So I, I'm not in making it up. So um, that for example, what you can do is you can go to, this is, you're not going to want to do this, but if you really wanted to find out what a medicine is doing in terms of blood levels, lots of numbers and equations and whatnot, you go to medicines.org, which is uh, the ni nice linked website. Now, if you do that, what you find is something quite interesting, that for Matteride XL, Dermosart, Zagatin XL, the wording that describes what the medicine's doing is exactly the same as Concerta XL. So they've just cut and pasted. Uh, I think that's suspicious, personally. I don't trust it. Um, but if you look at the one for Xenidate XL, th sorry, this is jargon. This is the area under the curve. Forget I say that, said that. But actually, it doesn't release as much. It only releases 110 against the 125 for Concerta XL. Online, you can go and look what the Medicines Committee for South West London and St George's say about prescribing medication for ADHD. And it says very specifically there, you should prescribe Xenidate XL because it's bioequivalent to Concerta XL. In fact, on the list of their recognised XL medicines, it's only Xenidate, Equisim, XL and Medic Medicinet XL. So the instruction to doctors around here is only prescribe Xenidate XL because it's bioequivalent. But, you know, the people who wrote that, I think in all honesty, thought the bioequivalence meant numerical equivalence, and it doesn't. Um, and I know, I know the clinician involved, and he would not have worked on those bodies. But yeah, well, I'm banging on, aren't I? The third problem about generic prescription, writing just Methyl phenidate, XL, something like that. Um, all lasting XLs are not the same. All the, the main ones, the Concerta, Stelmasart, Matteride, Zagatin. A lot of pressure across the country now for everyone to prescribe Zagatin. Um, I, I don't know why. I mean, it's no real different from Delmasart or Matteride. They're all Oros systems. When I was explaining the complicated structure of the Concerta XL, that is an Oros system. It's very clever. It can go wrong and not work, but it's very clever. And it gives you, a, you know, three phases, really, of release. Um, the academic pharmacists like Steve Bezier that I talk to, or who are prepared to talk to me, a bit puzzled by that, because the Concerta XL tablet clearly had three phases, whereas Matteride only has two, and we can't find out about Zagatin yet, because they haven't um, published all the details. But Xenidate is not that system, it's different, it's a wax tablet. It's a wax matrix with little granules in it. One sort of granule release now, one sort of granule release in four hours' time. Uh, five hours time. So it's not the same sort of thing, which is probably why it doesn't hit quite the same numbers. But it's, it's not only bioequivalent, but not exactly equivalent, but it's also a different way of doing things. Now that might be useful, but my gossip, or the gossip 
well, it is my gossip, I suppose. But the gossip I'm exposed to says Zenit 8 isn't really doing as well, doesn't last as long, doesn't deliver the goods. But I'm deeply suspicious, and because it's the people who make it are not members of the British Association of Pharmaceutical Companies, they don't have to release the data. So you have to go digging for it. Um, Steve Bazir and I, when it first came out, wrote letters to say we want to know what, how the tablet is made up. And we had to resort to industrial espionage to get the answer. You know, it's not straightforward. They don't have to release the info because it's, it's not a British company. Okay, all right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you get, uh, you'll see my reservations about generic prescription. I think it's okay, but you've got to know what you're doing if you're prescribing. You've got to know the traps. Um, I just put that up just because I will sometimes say stimulant, and I'm sure you'll, you know the distinction between stimulants and non-stimulants. Stimulants, methylphenidate, dexamphetamine, lisdexamphetamine, are powerful. They act immediately. You swallow them and you've got peak blood levels within an hour and you've got a clinical effect within about 30 minutes. Uh, they wake you up. In fact, um, for uh, the top two, that's what they were designed to do. They were designed to alert people. Um, uh, but because of that, you can only use them during the day. Whereas non-stimulants, the strateras and intunivs of this world, aren't as powerful. They're about 60% of the power of a stimulant. They take a bit of time to get going. You know, uh, you start in tune if even if you get up to the dose, you're still seeing an increase in effect two weeks, three weeks later. They build slowly, and atomoxetine builds very slowly indeed. So at 12 weeks, you're still seeing an increase of effect, even though the dose is steady. They're slightly sedating, sometimes very sedating, but you've got an effect that lasts for 24 hours. So you know, they are, it's a different way of doing things. They're different chemically uh, and they have different properties. So let us say uh, you're all very alert. Uh, <laughs> something's in the water. <laughs> let us say that you're a doctor and you have in front of you somebody with ADHD. How are you going to choose medicine in any case? I'm going off on a slightly different tack now. What are you going to do? Well, the first is, what's the evidence it works? Now, generally speaking, nowadays, the, ex the evidence that it works is going to be very strong. You won't see a medicine available for prescription that hasn't got through the European Medicines Agency or the MHRA. By and large, those two are the same at the moment. Um, so there's going to be pretty good evidence better for some than others. There's a whole lot of evidence about methylphenidate. There have been the occasional voice to say, yes, there's a lot of evidence, but most of it is from manufacturers' trials, and I think that is an issue. But you're going to say, how do we know it works? You're, that means you're going to be looking at, or well, hearing about, scientific trials. They, because they are, by and large, industry trials, you, you make a new medicine to get it given a, a license and approval uh, for you to bring it to market, you, you've got to show that it works in quite a sophisticated way. And nowadays, um, you have to show that it works for European ADHD, not just American ADHD. And the reason for that is that American ADHD is a mild condition. The Americans will say that ADHD affects 11% of the total school population. They will say that is what it is, and they want to treat all of it with medicines. That is a stated aim by national agencies. We want to medicate 11% of the American childhood population, which makes the elderly and naive like me jump a bit, um, because we would say that ADHD probably, at the level that you're going to see in clinics, is only really about 2%, 1 to 2% on a uh, I know that everyone says 5%, but the, the, the level at which you want to treat with medicines is going to be about 1 to 2%. Uh, and in practice, we are only treating about 0.6% of the school population. Whereas the Americans currently are treating 7.9%. So there's a massive difference between the American approach and the American definition of the condition compared with the way 
Europeans go about it um, unless we're talking about the French and perhaps we shouldn't. Um, the <coughs> problem about the supportive evidence is there are hardly any trials that do a proper head-to-head -head comparison. Is methylphenidate better than dexamphetamine? Is Stratera better than Intuniv? You, you can't get that evidence at all easily. There are one or two trials, but by and large we haven't got that information. We haven't got trials of combinations of drugs. In fact, in this country, combinations of drugs are frowned upon. I'll come back to that. So we don't know whether, for example, mixing methylphenidate and dexamphetamine is a good thing. Um, I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, I do have a few patients who I have got on both simultaneously, and I'm always surprised that it works as well as it does. But yet we don't, doesn't, we haven't got evidence on that sort of thing, so we don't know. Um, and nice, in particular, are you okay about nice? You know about nice. Yeah. Okay. Well, nice is a good thing, but it it has rules, and the rules are set for it by people who are not clinicians, and it's very very tight. What evidence can you accept? And the number of uh, trials, for example, they will accept, very small. So a lot of trials are kicked out because they're not good enough or they're too old or they haven't got blind allocation or blah, blah, blah. So they're very, very choosy. And I think that means there's a bit of a loss of information, actually. I, I know the argument the other way, but um, they are so choosy and it gets very, very tight. So. You've got the quality of the supportive evidence, which I can say something. There's something about the marketing authorization or the license. I hear so many times, GPs in particular, saying it's not licensed for adults. And I say, well, would you like to go and have a look? Because actually I think you'll find that... He, I've had this round last week. GP um, sent me an email saying he cannot prescribe um, methylphenidate for this concerta XR, actually, for this student because it's not registered, it's not licensed for adults. And I had to be terribly polite and give him precisely the website where he could see that, in fact, it is if it has been started in childhood and found to be effective. Um, but there's all sorts of fuss about licenses. Now, a license is properly called a marketing authorization. And if you call it a marketing authorization, which is what the official literature talks about, it's pretty clear there's nothing to do with doctors. I've heard very experienced doctors say, I can't prescribe off license, I'll be struck off, or even prosecuted. That is not true. Um, a marketing authorization applies to the manufacturer. So I've made a medicine. I go to the European Medicines Agency, I say, I want to um, release it. I want to market it so that people in the NHS can prescribe it, in independent practitioners can prescribe it. And they say, fine, have you got the evidence it works? Can you make it to an acceptable quality? And have you demonstrated that it's safe? That's the, those are the three questions. And if you can do all that to their standards, then you can have a license, but it's the manufacturer that has the license, and the license is pretty tight. It specifies that the dose is going to be 40 milligrams a day, it's going to be for the treatment of ADHD, not necessarily, oh, don't get me going, um, and it's going to be for um, 18 to 24 year olds because that was the group in the effectiveness trials. So they're very, very tight. Now, because of this, um, it's going to be trials in adults nearly always because adults you can ask for their permission you can ask them to volunteer they will take it uh, and that's fine very difficult to get an ethically approved child a trial on children because children can't really give fully informed consent um, you can actually manage this but it's very arduous and a scientific trial to get an authorization is going to cost you about a third of a million quid so if you're a manufacturer, you're not going to do this the hard way. You're going to think very carefully about uh, where's your market, which age are we going to test it on. Most children's medicines are off license. Uh, that doesn't apply, in fact, to most ADHD medicines, because it's the other way around. ADHD, you've got the other problem, that an awful lot of adults, are, if you prescribe for adults, you may be off license. Um, so it's nothing to do with doctors, though they all think it is. They all get terrified, and the, the um, 
managers of local health services get terrified say everybody should be we won't have any medicines prescribed off license and there's very rarely anyone from the children's health community who puts their hand up and say excuse me virtually everything we prescribe for children across the board whether it's antibiotics or chest medicines most of this is off license we have guidance about this from the Royal College of Paediatrics uh, they say no, no 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 we can't have that we want everything on license because then we're safe <coughs> You can see why they say it, but you can also see how ignorant they are if they do. Yeah. <laughs> All right, power. You want to, um, you've got a uh, child in front of you who's got really, really bad ADHD. So you don't want to dance around, you actually want to get him right. Um, so you're looking at the power of the medicine. Now, all right, don't, don't panic about these. This is just a list that says, on these numbers, this dexamphetamine is, is very powerful, really powerful medicine. So you think, great, all my patients should have it. But on the other hand, if you look at the other thing, which is how many people discontinue it because of adverse events, side effects in other words, then actually, um, you have to read these numbers around the other way, um, this dexamphetamine, for that matter, GXR is Intunif, uh, have got very high rates of um, side effects. So power, yes, but with power, quite often comes, become, comes side effects as well. So power is not the only answer. You've got to be, you've got to do a balancing act. All right. You choose a medicine because you know it. I've been prescri I mean, I was thinking on this, the way up here. I've been prescribing uh, methylphenidate for 42 years now. I'm very familiar with it. I, that means I keep on making the same mistakes. Um, you know, I, I know it. I know where I am with it. Um, I also know that his reputation is is pretty straightforward. You know, nobody thinks. Nobody in my business thinks methylphenidate is complicated. So that's going to influence people. But you then get mistaken concerns arising out of reputation. For example, the panic when Stratera came in that it caused suicidal behaviour. And I remember at that time I was asked to review the original series that suggested that suicidal behaviour would uh, crop up. And I mean, it didn't. I mean, I saw six cases out of about 1,500 where there was suicidal behaviour. And in four of those, it was an American teenager stamping their foot saying, don't let me go to the disco. This was in the 80s. I'm going to kill myself. And that gets entered as suicidal behaviour. Uh, now, nowadays, if you read the reviews, nobody thinks that Stratera causes suicidal behaviour. Yet it's still got black lines around it in the prescription manual. So the, the story won't go away, even though I don't think it's true. The same with stratera and liver damage. Nobody thinks that's true any longer. But at the beginning of the trials, trials you see are funny. Trials, when they're done in the States, the people who go into trials are recruited from advertisements in the local newspaper. Very, you know, and they are then screened to be just what, you know, you don't want any funny of people like you might see in a clinic. Yeah. <laughs> um, the story is still going around that Lisdex amphetamine, because it's an amphetamine, must be addictive. Actually, it just isn't. You, you, uh, it just is not addictive. It's not even fun to take unless you really hammer it. If you can get up to 300 milligrams a day, some people will say, yeah, it's, it's, it's not bad. But I, the, the story I like best is Dave Nutt's story. Uh, he was doling out uh, L. Vance to a very risky young adult character who was obviously on everything that came. He said, look, I think, I think we ought to give you this because you're screwing up your life. He said, but I'm worried um, that you're going to misuse it. He said, no, I'm not. He said, Dave, I think you are. He said, no, I'm not. Why would I? Th you, you write me the script, I take it out, I sell it on the street, and I buy some crack. <laughs> <laughs> um, or the story that stimulants usually stunt growth. Now, uh, they can uh, if you give enough for long enough, um, but even then, uh, it's not usual. And I, I must say, I've got um, around about 250 people on medication that I see. I've only got three where I've thought in recent years that there may be slowing of growth. And the growth doctors just don't agree with me. They just say, no, nah, no, nah, shut up, you've, been, you've read too many papers, Hill. 
Uh, this is just delayed puberty, for goodness sake. It runs in the family. So how much would you have to give for how long for that to be a reasonable risk? Um, I think the best study on this was very recently published. It was a follow-up of the MTA trial. And I looked at that and I did my own sums to answer just that question. And I think it was of the order of 60 milligrams of methylphenidate a day, every day, seven days a week, for 10 years. You know, it's that sort of thing. It is dose related. Now, I mean, uh, frankly, I very rarely do that, which is probably why I don't see it. I mean, but it's, uh, that's a pretty crude answer because it didn't happen to everybody. So although they give average figures, if you actually try and get into the numbers. Yeah, so that's twice what my kids say. Um, and, and, and when they say stunted growth, are we talking like 1% of how tall they would have been? Or how much stunting are we talking? <laughs> well, I don't know whether it's stunting because the kids who went into the MTA trial were on average bigger and heavier than the norm. So what a lot of people have said is what you're seeing is not actually stunting of growth, you're seeing normalization of growth. Because they were a funny group of kids, there were an awful lot of them, and they were very well studied. The MTA trial is excellent. Um, but I mean, I, it, it, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I think it's an overblown concern. I have seen it I mean, in a youngster that was seen at another clinic in another country that came under my care, and I was astonished at what he was being given. And I, so I cut it right back to the horror of his parents and the pleasure of him. Um, and his growth has returned to uh, normal, frankly, for his age. But it, you know, people in this country are neurotic about heighting and weighting the children they see. In fact, in a lot of clinics, that's all they do on follow-up. They just measure the child. They don't talk to the child, they don't adjust the dose, they don't talk to the parents, they just do height and weight. So this country is neurotic about it to an unhelpful degree, frankly. Um, so I don't think it's a big deal, but you know, the first question I'm asked, if I say, well, the conversation usually goes, are you going to put him on Ritalin? And I say, oh, not as such, it's unlikely, no, I don't, no, I'm not, but I'm going to put him on something rather similar. Fine, what are the side effects? So we go through the side effects. Um, how much is it going to stunt his growth? Well, the answer is, no, it isn't really. Um, oh, fine, all right, or we're not going anywhere near that, uh, or whatever they say. So I, uh, you know, Yes, I think there is a case for saying it, but it's certainly not usually. Um, blah, blah. The problem is, of course, that if you go online and tap into the American forums, you get opinions. And, and some of them are very interesting, actually. I, mean, I tend to read the forums, um, with, uh, and I make a noise when I do. Oh, my God! Um, you prescribe, uh, you're worried about side effects if you're going to prescribe. Obviously you are. Everyone is. Um, you've talked about the main effect in terms of power, but you're going to be concerned about side effects. So I mean, if you've got a girl with anorexia nervosa, you're going to be very careful about prescribing drugs that suppress appetite, stimulants or atomoxetine. Um, that actually lands you in a funny position because if you then prescribe Intuniv, on the little packet insert in Intuniv says may cause weight gain. So any respecting anorectic is going to panic at that and say so there has to be some explanation. Or you know, if you've got a kid with a sleep problem already, you're going to be jolly careful about how you manage uh, methylphenidate, for example, which um, nearly always causes difficulty getting off to sleep. Not always, but nearly always, if you give it too late. Uh, so uh, if you're making a decision about what to prescribe, you've got an eye on side effects, I'm sure. And um, then there's the whole thing about pharmacology. The, I mean, if you've got somebody on Elvance, which works because it stops the reabsorption of noradrenaline as a neurotransmitter. That's how it does it. It just stops nerve cells reabsorbing noradrenaline. So there's more noradrenaline kicking around in the synapse to affect the next cell in the chain. Uh, if it hasn't worked, then if going in for um, Stratera, which is also a noradrenaline reuptake blocker on, in, in pharmacology terms, it's not going to work. So, and I get fed up with this because 
well I'll come back to why I'm fed up but you know, you've got to think about if you're a doctor if you know anything about it why am what is the pharmacology of this stuff compared with that stuff and does this make sense and, and then the whole thing about availability there are restrictions or advisory restrictions on doctors about what they can and cannot prescribe I mean, I mentioned the case of the South West London, the Maudsley and uh, Zenidate XL. Uh, exactly the same, uh, for example, in the Wirral um, prescribing guidelines, which are actually drawn up by a very sensible man. Um, but it says, do not prescribe Concerta XL. It just says it, because it's too expensive. You know, you, your choice may be limited. And if, you, if you're a GP and you step outside that and say, well, sod it, I'm going to prescribe Concerta XL, what they then do is waste your time. They say, would you like to come and explain to the med local medicines committee on uh, Tuesday evening at seven o'clock? We'll keep you waiting for three hours. Uh, they, they manipulate your time and your family's time by doing this sort of game. So the pressure is on. They can't actually stop you, really. You have the right to prescribe. But the local pharmacy may kick up and say, well, it's not on our formulary list, blah, blah, blah. So there are all sorts of hidden mechanisms that mean that some stuff isn't available or it's not available in this country, whereas it is in the States. And every month I have somebody saying, can I go on Adderall? And I say, well, no, you, you can't, because it's very difficult to import Adderall. I can do it if you're prepared to pay an outrageous price. But frankly, for the amount you're going to pay for me to get an import license for Adderall, which is a mixed amphetamine salt, very popular and very effective in the States, um, you might as well spend the money on a plane fare and go over and get it yourself. <laughs> so availability... Uh, certainly for controlled drugs is difficult. Sorry, what, what are the drugs that Adderall is made on? Uh, it's made of mixed amphetamine salts. It's made of dextro... How good's your chemistry? Uh, should I be? It's probably not as good as yours, but... <laughs> okay. Um, it, what, what it, but I asked because earlier in the presentation you yep. said that we don't mix drugs. And then yeah, that's right. This one yeah. Well, it's all dexamphetamine, okay. but it combines um, dextroamphetamine, which is the usual gunk that is around, with levoamphetamine, which is actually quite an interesting variant. It's not as powerful, but it lasts longer. And then it comes as two different literally salts. Now that I think is irrelevant. It's a good drug. You know, I, I like Adderall. I, one, of the, one of the mistakes in my life was when I was asked by a little company of four guys in a garage in Andover who called themselves Shire. They said we are thinking about buying a medicine for dementia. Would you have a look at it and tell us what you think? I said I don't know anything about dementia. And they said, well, okay, um, well, what you've said is very interesting. Would you like to tell us about another medicine that we're interested in, which was Adderall, made by Richwood in the States? Uh, and I said, yeah, okay, um, I'd buy it. I really would buy it. Um, it it's, you know, it, it makes sense pharmacologically. It's, uh, I, I do actually know about it. It works very well. Though Richwood are an edgy company. <coughs> so why don't you just buy it and, and get it for yourself? And they said, would you like some shares in our company? I said, I'm not allowed to. You know, doctors are not allowed then to buy shares in pharma companies. So I said, I can't. But if I had actually stopped being a doctor then and bought <laughs> a 15% uh, stake in Shire, I would be really very, you know, Shire is a massive pharma. <coughs> um, wh why did I suddenly get going on to that? Oh, because uh, we're talking about Adderall, yeah. Well, I told them to buy Adderall, and they did. <laughs> I think they were going to do it in any case. But. Um, no, I think uh, you're quite right. I mean, Adderall is a sort of dirty mixture. It was de developed originally in uh, Hungary, I think, as a tonic, rather like Ritalin was years ago. You know, get some amphetamine, mix it up a bit, and give it to people who think they need a tonic, and it works very well. Um, but yes, I mean, it's, from that point of view, it's a messy prescription, but it just happens to work rather well. Okay, um, well I've made the point about local formularies. These are lists in any area which doctors are expected within the NHS to stick to. And if they step outside the formulary, there's trouble. Now, consultants are usually given a bit more leeway than GPs. And a common discussion I have with somebody, let's say, on the South Coast, is um, I ask the GP, will they take over the prescription of, uh, 
I don't know, Liz Dexamphetamine, for example. And they say, well, actually, no, we can't, because it's not on our formula. It has to be a consultant drug, because it's a red, red list. You know about the traffic light system? Red is consultants. Yellow is GPs with regular consultant supervision. Green is what the hell anyone can prescribe it. <laughs> it's a very strange arrangement. It particularly comes into play with melatonin, um, which nobody really seems to know how to manage. Uh, and these formulas are driven by cost. The local one for here... Um, somebody I know went to present uh, the information about um, intuitive, about guanfacine, and they just said, what's the, what's the cost? That's all they were interested in. They weren't interested in, does it treat some people that other medicines can't? Uh, does it actually add to existing, does it, you know, blah, blah. They weren't interested. They just don't want to know the price. Um, yeah, here we are. This was the slide I was looking for. Here we are, southwest London, St. George's. The... Um, I think this was 2010, uh, and there you are. This is what you're allowed to prescribe. You either have methylphenidate, either Ritalin or Medicinet. Ritalin only comes as 10 milligram tablets, so it's not that widely used, frankly. You can do Xenidate XL, first line, or Equisim XL, or Medicinet XL, and that's all. There's nothing else on this list. And that's this local patch. That's what I was looking for earlier. Now, NICE, which has recently... Um, uh, read, uh, rewritten itself um, very well in many ways tends to have this model in its head that initially you decide uh, if you're a prescribing doctor are you going to go for a stimulant methylphenidate or dexamphetamine or lisdexamphetamine or are you going to go for a non-stimulant you're going to make that decision basically on is somebody going to abuse a stimulant in which case you give them a non-stimulant um, are they, have they got ticks is because stimulants have the reputation for making ticks worse, which isn't quite as strong as it might seem. How long do you want each dose to last for? You know, do you want it to last through till the next following morning? Because these will do that. What about sleep? And, and actually, what do the family want? So the first decision you make is, do you go stimulant or non-stimulant? Now, in practice, most people go stimulant. Um, and nice says you should start with methylphenidate E. Um, e does not refer to MDMA, it's just the, the way it's uh, done on there. So uh, the first thing you do is methylphenidate, and they argue that you should think uh, about starting with a sustained release preparation. They think that's the best thing to do. Then if that doesn't work, then you should go for dexamphetamine or lisdexamphetamine in real terms. And if that doesn't work, you should go to a non-stimulant. And I've already made the point that it doesn't really make sense if you're going to do that to go to atomoxetine, because if it doesn't, if it is dex doesn't work, then I'm pretty sure that uh, the stratera isn't going to work either. Um, they only talk about one drug at a time. So that this is one drug to another drug to another drug. It doesn't talk about combinations. And I think uh, that's uh, interesting, because it leans on the trials and the trials that are form the evidence are nearly always funded by the drugs industry. And they're only going to test one drug at a time. They're not going to test their drug and competitors unless they're pretty confident of the result. They just don't do it. And it's very expensive. Trials are expensive. So they, the idea is you choose sequence. You go for one, uh, then you go for another, then you go for another. The idea is that you, you change, therefore, you go from methylphenidate to lisdex if it doesn't work or what doesn't work well enough if you've wound it up to the maximum dose if it's poisonous if it causes lots of side effects um, or sorry toxicity and side effects not quite the same uh, you, know, you may have got to a working dose but the kid is stoned you don't want that that's what I mean by dose related toxicity um, or rotten side effects well okay but how do you know when to change? If you're measuring the effect on a rating scale, then you know how far you've got. Most doctors, frankly, don't do that as much as they should. I know that a lot do, um, but, but you know, have you got a measurement of how much it's worked before you decide to change? Can you, what about the side effects? Are actually 
very good guidelines on how to manage side effects, so there isn't necessarily a reason for changing. And what is this maximum dose business? This is a paper, well-respected paper, of 17 teenagers, roughly speaking 16-year-olds, who were taking Concerta XL at between 126 and 270 milligrams a day. Now that's going for it, I must say. Um, uh, what they did was they rounded up these kids and took blood off them to say, well, okay, if you're taking this amount of medicine, what are ever's happening to the levels of medicine in your blood? And the answer is they were normal. They're just like the sort of levels you get from, say, 36 or 54 milligrams a day. So some people need very, very high doses to get an adequate clinical response and an adequate blood level, and none of these had dose-related side effects. Now, I think this is a very, very important paper, because usually you hear people saying, well, the maximum dose of methylphenidate is 60 milligrams or 90 milligrams or something like that. Well, across the board, yeah, but not for everybody. Um, the other thing is whether you should change or whether you should automatically try everyone on methylphenidate and dexamphetamine, or well, dexamphetamine. And these people in Norway, who are well respected, the Ramfet outfit, just south of Norway, um, what they did in their community clinic, this is not a laboratory, this is a community clinic, is they said, okay, everyone coming into the clinic with ADHD gets methylphenidate, and then a few weeks later gets dex and we'll see which is best and which has fewer side effects. And the uh, interesting thing is they got a 92% success rate. Now that's very, very high. Most things you read will say there's an 80% success rate for stimulants. And actually that is only true if you stick to one stimulant. But if you try both, you get very high success rates. Are you meaning together? No, one, one after the other. As you yeah. stick in the end to the one you... You stick to the one that you're either, either worked best for you or had side effects you could manage. Yes, no. Um, no, it's not together. It, it's, uh, it was four weeks on one and four weeks on the other with, with adjustment of the dose within those four weeks. But I think it's really interesting. I mean, it, it actually, it's in line with... Um, other work, and you may have seen the Gene Arnold's pie chart that shows exactly the same thing. Although half of all people respond equally well to methylphenidate or dex, doesn't really matter. A quarter do better on dex and a quarter do better on methylphenidate. People are different. So, um, given that you've got this sort of thing, if you're going to a non-stimulant, or if you're going to a non-stimulant because stimulants have been unacceptable or haven't worked. How do you choose between these two? Um, nobody knows. Hard, but the basic information I think we're reasonably confident in is that um, Intuitive may well reduce ticks on its own. It's very like clonidin, which has been used for years to treat ticks. It doesn't always work, but it's pretty straightforward. It doesn't suppress appetite, which is important. Um, um, but uh, sleepiness is a common problem, particularly in the first month. Whereas atomoxetine stratera may well help ADD when the problem that causes the ADD is slow cognitive processing. I don't mean that they're stupid, I mean that they think slowly and carefully. Uh, and they are around. Saw one yesterday. Um, but the problem with atomoxetine, as I'm sure you know, is a high rate of intestinal side effects and nausea. It's a problem. So choosing is not straightforward. Um, if you, there's no guidance on combinations either. I'm just getting off how you choose between them because I think it's hard. Uh, you may have to try both. We don't know what combinations work. We know that in the States, a stimulant like methylphenidate plus guanfacine plus Intuniv works very well indeed. And nearly everybody I've got on Intuniv is also on a stimulant. It's a dream combination. It works like a charm. I mean, I'm exaggerating, of course, uh, and I don't have shares in Shire. Um, but, you know, that's the way to do it, I reckon, because you, the Intuniv gives you coverage in the evenings and the mornings, whereas it's not very powerful during the day, 
uh, and for the kids that I see who've commonly got educational related problems or school behaviour related problems, uh, that works very well. Adding stuff to sleep, I mean, NICE is not helpful on this. NICE says, well, yeah, you do uh, melatonin, but it's very unspecific about how much melatonin, when you give it, and the usual problem for kids on melatonin is they get given circadin. Now, circadin was designed for the over 55s, and I can tell you um, that after nearly 20 years of taking it, therefore, on license, it works brilliantly because it's 25% immediate release but 75% sustained release so it stops the waking at half past two and three o'clock in the morning. That's irrelevant for children. You want to get them off to sleep but only a quarter of the circuit in tablet will do that. Best given early in the evening not half an hour before bedtime. You need to be giving it sort of six o'clock if you really want melatonin to work uh, and then you, and you have to get you know, all the other things like the tablet's confiscated, the router turned off, and uh, dark lighting, and, and all that. So there's not good guidance on this, which is a great shame. There's not good guidance on how to manage very aggressive behaviour, or very excitable mood swings associated with ADHD. NICE has been a little bit better this time around, saying actually risperidone can be quite useful. Now why it says risperidone I don't know, because if you are used to this area, aripiprazole is a damn sight easier. It's got fewer side effects. Um, it used to be very expensive, but now there's a generic out, it's quite cheap. But there's no, you know, no good national guidance on it. This is such a common problem. Uh, and or the other thing is um, adding uh, an SSRI, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, you know, the, the, the uh, fluoxetins or Prozac or sertralins, lustrals of this world, for anxiety, which is such a common problem. We've got no guidance on this. And this is very bad for doctors because they don't know how to do it. The last conference I went to, which is senior consultants, I had two people come up saying, is it safe to give sertralin alongside methylphenidate? Well, the answer is yes perfectly safe. There isn't a problem. Just don't mix fluoxetin and um, that's Prozac. Don't mix Prozac and, um, in, and uh, Lisdexamphetamine and Elvance. Elvance and, and Prozac is a mixture to be very careful of. I can explain if this. So guidelines, yeah, good thing, good decisions. Um, they can be abused by managers. I've heard managers say nice is a luxury we cannot afford. I've heard managers say, we will not sanction anything that hasn't been approved by NICE. You, you can use it both ways to control doctors. They're very narrow, the guidelines, by just going for one drug at a time and not talking about combinations. And I think the main problem for me is it stops clinicians finding out for themselves. They just do what they're told, they think. They treat the guidelines as a tram line. Say, well, we're only going to do this. It's not, not, not approved by NICE, which I think is unhelpful. So I think, basically, uh, although I'm pro-NICE, I think NICE is a good organisation. It's got an excellent international reputation. It goes about its business well, but it only goes so, f so far. And it's vulnerable, I think, to uh, uh, abuse by management as a way of controlling um, people who want to find out what works best beyond what NICE say. Thank you very much.